Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have another uh, session on TPP 2.0 and SBA updates. And uh, we are so pleased to have uh, wonderful panelists, uh, speakers today. They are the expert and many of them has been supporting chamber events in the past. We're glad uh, they can, you know, uh, join us back again today. So. Uh, while we are waiting for more people, I would like to just uh, give a very brief introduction about the chamber. My name is Cindy Shaw, uh, the president of the Asian American Chamber. So I want to first recognize uh, our wonderful leaders, uh, board of directors, and uh, uh, definitely a huge uh, shout out to our sponsors who have been supporting us for many years. And uh, we do encourage everyone to join us if you are not a member yet. We offer uh, all year long uh, events and program and support our members growth. So uh, upcoming events, after today's event, uh, we will have another session uh, in Chinese language on PPP updates. And uh, next month, uh, here comes the Lunar New Year. And we are putting together a celebration uh, event. And we will have speakers from Loudoun County and uh, uh, Howard County, also Secretary of the Maryland uh, Commerce uh, will be with us uh, to celebrate the uh, Lunar New Year together. And uh, uh, two other events, one about I-495, I-270, uh, P3 program and the leaders on digital transformation. This is a date, uh, please uh, save the date uh, for our uh, signature events, Geo South Asia Chamber Awards Gala. We will recognize the outstanding business in the region. So, John and I know Chair Becker and also MT Bank, they are all our uh, sponsors. We, we truly appreciate uh, your support. So next, actually, let's welcome uh, Sherilyn, uh, our uh, MC uh, moderator today. Sherilyn, uh, we thank you so much for supporting Chamber program many, many times. I know uh, <laughs> March, uh, you will join us again for another session. So Sherilyn, uh, her practice area cover business, garment contracting, and nonprofit. Uh, her clients benefit from uh, Sherilyn's 20 plus years of experience in this region, uh, including time as a high ranking official at the SBA Department of Veteran Affairs and as an advisor to members of Congress and presidential candidates. So Sherilyn, uh, Mike, off to you and uh, thank you for supporting us again today. My, my pleasure, Cindy. Thank you for that nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on PPP 2.0 and SBA updates. So Cindy's already given you my introduction. And I would like to introduce by B, followed by pound. our all-star panel. Pound Without further delay, let's get started. Mark Blackston is a lifelong Maryland resident and has 30 years banking experience. He's an administrative vice president and business banking regional manager at M&T Bank in the greater Washington, Maryland market and is part of M&T's PPP project team. John Carpenter is a principal with Cherry Beckard's Government Contractor Services Group. John has served the financial needs of government contractors and other commercial entities since 1979. Rod Johnson is a native Washingtonian and is currently serves as a Lender Relations Small Business Development Center Project Officer at the SBA. He is the PPP expert at SBA. He has over 30 years of experience in large corporate, commercial, and business banking lending experience in the not-for-profit government contracting and commercial real estate sectors. Craig Engelhaupt is Vice President, Senior SBA Relationship Manager and has 35 years of banking experience, including loan programs such as SBA Express, 
7A, 504, and export working capital programs in the mid-Atlantic region. So as you can hear, we have fabulous panelists. Please welcome all of our panelists. Now, each panelist is going to give a very short opening statement before we go right into our Q&A, because our goal today is to be able to answer your questions. And just a, a housekeeping note, we will get started with Q&A as soon as our panelists do uh, their, give their opening statements, but you are welcome to put questions as well in the chat. All right, let's start with Rod Johnson with SBA, and then we're gonna go into Mark, John, and then Craig. Take it away, Rod. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Rod Johnson with the Washington Metropolitan District Office. And we cover Montgomery County and Prince George's County in Maryland, all of Northern Virginia, and of course, Washington, DC. So I'm going to give you some quick highlights on the Debt Relief Act and of course, PPP. And then I'll be followed up by um, Mark and John who will give you a little more granular view of the PPP program. So I will go ahead and get started. First of all, this is the time to get money. There is plenty of money out there for you small business owners to grow and sustain your businesses, okay? So you have PPP money, draws one and two. You have idle money, that is the idle loan and the idle grant. And now, hot off the presses as of yesterday, you have enhancements to the SBA Business Development Program, primarily the 7A, the 504, and the SBA Express. So let me go over those first. Now, 7A loans go up to, as you know, $5 million. When now the SBA is offering a 90% guarantee to the banks to actually put more money out on the street, lend more money to you to help you grow your business. Now, what's important about that is there are no fees charged to you for the 7A program. The SBA Express, we know if you know, the loan maximum loan amount was $350,000. Now, because of COVID-19, it is up to $1 million. The SBA used to offer a 50% guarantee to the banks. Now, it's a 75% guarantee to the banks, and there are no fees charged to you. The 504 program, okay, where you're putting down 10%, the CDC takes 40 and the bank takes 50%, there are no 504 fees to you, okay? Now, if you already have an existing SBA loan, 7A, 504, microloan, you're supposed to automatically be put into a deferred status. The SBA on your behalf, will pay principal and interest for three months to the bank on your behalf. If you take out a new 7A 504 microloan, the SBA will pay the first six months of that new, one of those new loans for you, principal and interest again for up to the first six months. All right, now let me give you some highlights for PPP. The SBA has set aside $15 billion out of the $284 billion, right, in PPP funds for small businesses with 10 or fewer employees applying for the first loan. And, the, and they are subject, you guys are subject to the original terms of the PPP loan, meaning you can borrow up to $10 million, okay? And you don't have to, there's no requirement for you to show any decline in revenues, okay? And these loans, these applications can be calculated either by using the 2019 or 2020 financials. Now, for you small businesses that were temporarily closed down or suspended, you're eligible for the second round of PPP. But those that have been closed permanently, no, you are not eligible. Okay, so I wanted to let you know that because I get a lot of questions about that, okay? The second loan, businesses that previously received a PPP loan, that is PPP 1.0, and you're applying 
for another PPP, PPP 2.0, you must show a 25% decline in revenue compared to the same period, right? In 2020, compared to the same period in 2019. So let's pick a period. September 30th, 2019 versus September 30th, 2020. Between those two periods, you need to show a 25% decline. Also, and I'm sure John will talk about this later or Mark, where if you don't have audited financial statements, then you need to certify, you need to sign and date either those QuickBooks statements, those compiled statements, or the reviewed financial statements to turn into the bank. So I just want to make sure that you know that. And of course, the maximum loan amount for PPP 2.0, second draw, is $2 million. Okay. Now, if the SEPIN application is with the same lender and time period as the first, then you need not have to provide additional information according to the IFR. Okay. However, the lenders, I just want to let you know, the lenders may require additional information. And I do think that if you go to the same lender, um, since they know you, generally they won't require additional information, but they can if they need it. Now, small businesses that were approved for PPP, but for whatever reason, you turned it down or you returned it, all right, you can reapply for the money up to the original amount of $10 million, not $2 million, but $10 million, okay? You can apply for up to $10 million if you gave the money back or um, you decided to just turn it down. And then independent contractors, you 1099s, because I get a lot of questions on this, the 1099s, single member LLCs, sole proprietorships, you can apply for PPP 1.0 if you didn't apply before, or a PPP 2.0 if you've used all of the 1.0, PPP 1.0 money, okay? If you're having a hard time getting rid of that PPP 1.0, just go ahead, and I'm sure John and, and, and Mark will back me up on this, then go ahead and bonus the money to your employees to show that you've used all the money and then go ahead and, and put in for that PPP 2.0. And then lastly, on the forgiveness front, the form is out for, the forgiveness form is out for 150,000 and below. So for those of you who have been waiting to apply for forgiveness and your loan was 150,000 or below, now you can go ahead and, and apply. Look, 87% of the $525 billion in PPP money that was put out there as of August 10th, all right, 87% of those loans had a loan amount of $150,000 and below. So that's the majority of you all out there. So go ahead and apply. And as long as you use the money within the parameters of PPP 2.0 now, then you should be 100% forgiven. All right, so now we'll turn it over to Mark for a little deeper. Mark. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Rod. Appreciate that uh, transition, and thanks for all the updates. Um, again, my name is Mark Blackson. I'm proud to work at M&T Bank, and, and my primary goal, along with my colleagues over these past many, many weeks, has been to help uh, our businesses who are, quite frankly, still struggling through this pandemic to receive those good monies that are available through the PPP program. Um, so really happy to be here today. Thanks to Cindy for putting this together for the uh, chamber, um, as well as my colleague Stephanie Shea, um, who I know is a, you know one of the folks who, who coordinates this effort. Um, I wanted to just share, you know, as a follow-up to what Rod said, um, there is plenty of money available. Um, so of the $284 billion that was allocated for PPP 2.0, uh, as of the uh, January 24th program update on the SBA.gov site. Um, there's 35 billion that was approved for funding as of that reporting. So as Rod said, there's still plenty of funds available. 
um, you know, to, to participate in this program, but I, we do urge you not to delay and, and, and wait. So if you, if you think you're interested in applying, please do so. Um, as Rod said, you can go back to the lender that you went to for your first draw. Um, but, you know, again, m and is happy to help any, any client or that we are also finding ways to help clients that aren't currently with us. Um, and we're happy to, to help you out with that as well if you need help with uh, PPP. And I will just give a little plug for m and We were really happy with some of the work that our colleagues are doing across the industry where 4,500 banks stepped up already with this PPP 2.0 process. And we were proud to see that m and Bank was the actual number one bank in approved funding dollars through this first round of reporting uh, across the nation. So um, really just a great, great, great testament to my colleagues for helping to push some of those dollars out for our businesses. Um, so with that, I'd love to share a, a couple of uh, PowerPoint slides to go into some details of comments that Rod made earlier. Um, and Sherilyn, I promise to try to keep it in the in five to seven minutes so we can get to this other great Q&A. So, but if you need to give me the, the hey, time to get off the screen, don't hesitate. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to try to share, let's see here. You should see on your screen. Over, overview of Paycheck Protection Program, information as of January 8th, is that showing up on your screen? Yes. Great. Okay, and, I, and before I begin, um, I will share this deck uh, with Cindy so she can get it out to the group. This is available on the MTB website. I do also wanna say that this is specific in some cases to how m processes PPP applications. So if you are going to use a, a different colleague in the banking industry for your loan, please um, you know, reach out to them because they may have some specific uh, um, situations for how they process their applications. And then lastly, the typical disclaimer that this is not intended um, to, um, it's for informational purposes only, not intended to give advice, all that stuff. It's just a resource as we all work together with this um, PPP program. So let me jump in real quick. So um, what, what we're seeing here are some of the highlights. Rod went over it, so I'm not gonna go over all the details, but again, uh, on December 27th, um, the law was passed. We reopened the PPP program, um, you know, to borrowers, and we introduced the second draw program, which Rod mentioned. I'll go into that in a little bit of detail. Uh, in addition, they made some additional changes to what eligible costs could be included this time around, which includes some things like covered operating expenses, property damage, supplier costs, um, and covered worker protection expenses. Um, in addition, it pro prohibits any entity that has gone out of business and has no intention of reopening from receiving a PPP loan. That was something they added. And then lastly, as Rod mentioned, uh, simplified the forgiveness process by updating the um, 3508S application uh, to go up from 50,000, which it had been previously, to 150,000. And banks are just starting to incorporate that in their process. The form was released. Um, but banks may not yet have that as part of their process yet. So double check with your bank where you got your first loan, need to ask for forgiveness uh, if they are using that form quite yet. All right. Um, so now that we have the overall highlights, let's talk about certain eligibility requirements for the initial PPP loan. And keep in mind, this is for first time borrowers, people that have not yet um, had a PPP loan yet. Businesses and certain nonprofits, veteran organizations, tribal business concerns, sole props, self-employed individuals, and independent contractors are all eligible to apply. However, they must have been in operation since February 15th of 2020. In order to be eligible, most businesses may not have more than 500 employees. There are some exceptions. Businesses like housing co-ops, 50C6 organizations like a chamber of commerce, or designated marketing, um, they have a max of 300 employees. But some businesses would be eligible if they have over uh, 500, they just have to meet certain SBA size standards. And you can check with your bank um, a little bit more on that if, you have, if, you, if that falls into your situation. Also the loan amount maximum for a PPP loan is 2.5 times the average monthly payroll costs up for up to $10 million. Again, this is for the first draw. Um, and very similar to the guidance as Rod mentioned as it first rolled out back in April. There are, there are also various eligibility requirements that we'll address within the application here as we progress a little bit further. Um, as Rod mentioned, there is, is now something called the second draw. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, this is for borrowers who took out an initial PPP loan and are looking to apply for a second PPP loan. 
Please note that uh, second PPP loan means that you have previously received it from either M&T or another financial institution like Rod mentioned. Um, similar to the initial loan requirements, you must have been in business since February 15th of 2020 to be eligible. And of course that relates to all the eligible organization types um, indicated in the, green, um, in the green box there. Um, now let's review some of the other eligibility uh, requirements that are available. So in order to qualify for the second draw, you must have, again, had previously received a PPP loan, either from M&T or another, um, and you've already used the full amount um, for that uh, by the disbursement date of the second PPP loan. So you don't have to go through the forgiveness process. You just have to prove that you've used the full amount of that first loan within the covered period and demonstrate that you used it. Um, also, you may not have more than 300 employees. So please remember that an employee count covers all employees. That's full-time, part-time, and other status. So a lot of folks, the common errors we see is they're just putting their full-time equivalents when they're applying. Make sure you're capturing that all employee number when you're going through that process. Um, you also must demonstrate a revenue reduction of 25%, as Rod mentioned earlier, uh, on a, either a quarter-quarter basis when you're comparing the equivalent quarter for 2020 versus the same quarter in 2019. There's also options to use the annual gross receipts uh, on an annual basis. So um, you know, make sure you're keeping an eye on what the application requires if you're gonna be using that. Um, so some of the highlights um, of PPP. So you know, borrowers will need to certify that they've been impacted by COVID. Um, we do require that the SBA does require that it's one loan per tax ID number. Um, so making sure that you're not applying uh, for multiple loans under the same tax ID number that will get captured as it goes through the process. Um, again, there are, if, if this ultimately does turn into a loan situation, as a reminder, there are, no, there are no prepayment penalties for those loans to be paid off. Again, this is if it doesn't get forgiven on the back end. It is a loan. There are no prepayment penalties for paying it off. No collateral is required. No personal guarantees. And the repayment terms are uh, very similar to the first round. Uh, it's a 1% rate of interest and it's amortized over a 60 uh, month period loan. Again, that's if it's uh, an unforgiven balance on that uh, after you go through that process. And then lastly, pro prohibits any entity that has gone out of business, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, from, from, and they're saying they're not gonna reopen from applying for a PPP loan. The common questions that a lot of us are getting are around documentation. This is a very, very busy uh, PowerPoint deck, so I'm not gonna go into all the information. And again, this will be available to you after this uh, session um, you know, at, with a link. Um, but um, basically, you just need to prove, um, a, you need to first provide documentation to establish that the business was in operation as of February 15, 2020. You also have to provide payroll or income documentation. So once you determine what it, what it is, you need to make sure that you have it, it's easily accessible. Um, and then if you work with a bank that is using an online portal, just figure out which way they want it sent, whether it's in a PDF form, a Word document, an Excel sheet, everybody runs it a little bit differently. So make sure you know that that'll make the, your life easier when you apply. Um, at m &T, we do ask that it's set in a PDF form um, for processing through our online portal. Um, so for businesses with employees, you will need to provide documentation for your business to calculate the average monthly payroll for 2019, 2020, or the 12 month period um, to the application, um, such as maybe recognized by a third party payroll processor records or payroll tax filings like your 941s, your 940s, and those documents that everyone should be familiar with. Um, included on the chart um, to the left, you may see other things on there. So, you know, make sure you're providing evidence, evidence in areas of health insurance premium payments, retirement plan funding, uh, as well as state and local taxes paid by the company. Um, those are also things that are eligible to be included as part of that. Um, a little nuance again, um, if you are self-employed or an independent contractor, please provide the 1099 form for 2019 or your Form 1040 C or F uh, to support your payroll request as you're doing, doing your application. Um, I think John's gonna go into a little bit more about how this works, but um, I'll just give this simple uh, explanation. Um, you know, a lot of folks are asking and to share some tips on preparing payroll costs. Um, so not to oversimplify it, um, but your payroll costs are made up of the sum of all included payroll costs minus the sum of excluded payroll costs that equals your total annual payroll costs. One of the key words here is included. So what's included? Um, so we have a little chart here on the right. Um, 
outlining the payroll costs that can be included. That's wages, commissions, income, net earnings from employment, um, but they're also capped at $100,000. Um, so first remember that any, anything over 100, um, that will need to be adjusted. So for example, if you have an employee that makes over $100,000 annually, their payroll is only eligible up to that $100,000 amount. So as an example, if an employee makes say $127,000 and you are not able to, you are not able to include that 27,000 overage when calculating your annual payroll amount. It's only up to the $100,000. So again, encouraging everyone before they apply to familiarize yourself with uh, what's included, what are some of the regulations specifically around this $100,000, which we do tend to get a lot of questions around. Um, and then how does forgiveness work? Uh, we talked about this maybe on a prior seminar, so I won't go into it too much, but I'll just share this for highlighting purposes. Um, obviously, you need to make sure that under program rules that the monies are used 60% minimum for payroll costs. The remaining 40% can be used for any of those eligible non-payroll costs. The legislation was updated to include some additional things in addition to the business rent and leases, mortgage business interests, business utilities. It now includes covered personal protective equipment expenses, um, covered uh, property damage um, expenses that may have been um, a result of um, you know, potential damage to businesses received, um, covered supplier expenses, and also covered operational expenses. And, and the uh, application does outline what all that includes, but this is just a high level uh, as you're uh, looking to do that. And then lastly, how do you apply? So at MT, we're using an online portal. So um, if you're a customer, um, it's pretty simple. You just go onto our website and you can access the online portal. If you're a non-customer and you'd like to be one, we are allowing this time that you can become a customer and apply for PPP. So we encourage you to reach out to your local banker, um, call Stephanie Shea, um, you know, happy to help you out uh, to, to walk you through that process. If you're not an MT client, please reach out to your bank. Everybody's really stepping up together in the industry, proud to be part of it. We're all working together in this, um, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help you, um, you know, with that next step process. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to John. Yes, thank you, Mark. And let me try to unhook this, or maybe Cindy, you can unhook, unhook my screen share. Let's see. All right, John, you're on deck. All right. Mark, thank you, and Sherilyn, thank you. Um, yeah, Cindy, if you're able to put up that that table that we had earlier, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about a part of the appropriations bill that was passed right at, right in December at the end of the year, which included the appropriations for PPP two that Rod and Mark have outlined. But there's another program in there that's that's separate from PPP. Um, now, this is only for, for certain types of businesses, but this is what's called the Shuttered Venue Operator Program, and these are grants. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes for those of you who either may fit this description or maybe you have friends or colleagues that, that operate businesses that might fit this description, because this is a very, very attractive program. So what are we talking about? Shuttered Venue Operators. Uh, are, are the eligible, what are the eligible entities here are museum operators, um, motion picture theater operators, anyone who's operating a venue uh, that gives live, that provides live entertainment, theatrical productions, performing arts organizations. So these are, these are the eligible entities. And here in this table, I've just shown kind of a very high level comparison between these grants and PPP2. One of the main reasons I'm, I wanted to walk through this is because if you fit, if you think you fit the description of what I just described, then you really have a choice to make. Do you want to apply for PPP2, assuming you got a PPP1 loan last year, or do you want to apply for one of these grants? And you really need to consider your options because if you apply for PPP2, just by applying, you automatically are not eligible for an SVO grant. So you really need to think about it before you make the application. So what are the key differences? Well, as, as Brad and Mark highlighted, PP, these second draw PPP loans capped at 2 million. The SVO grants capped at 10 million. 
How are they calculated? Well, as Mark said, PPP2 calculated at two and a half times your average monthly payroll. Um, the shuttered, the SBO grants <clears throat> are calculated, <clears throat> excuse me, at 45% <clears throat> of your 2019 gross earned revenue. For, I'd say, a good many SVO operators, that 45% is a much larger number than two and a half times the average monthly payroll. <clears throat> but that can vary. And so, you know, individuals need to take a look at what's best for their situation. What's the maximum size of the business? For the second draw loan, 300 employees. For the SBO grant, 500. In either case, you have to demonstrate the same 25% revenue decline, just as, as Mark outlined. How can you use the money? Well, Mark talked about how you can use the money, or at least if you want to get forgiveness under PPP, you have to use 60% of the money for basically payroll and benefits costs. And we already talked about how the other 40% can be used. Under an SVO grant, you really, it's, it's pretty wide open. There's no restriction on how much has to be used for payroll. So it can be used for payroll, lease expense, utilities, other ordinary business expenses. Um, you can't use it to go buy another piece of property. Uh, you can't acquire another entity, but your flexibility of what types of expenses you can cover, including perhaps back rent, including the costs that you expect to incur to perhaps modify your physical space so that patrons and customers are feel safer when they return to your venue that's all eligible so the the flexibility of of how you're going to spend the money is is really uh, quite wide how big is the program now here's this is worth paying attention to um, as i think rod mentioned ppp currently has a, an appropriation of about 284 billion dollars uh, and, you know, will that be enough money? Well, who knows? And I'm certainly not here to read the, the, uh, the sentiment of Congress, but I think there's probably, if, if, if that program were to, to run short on funds, there's probably a lot of members of Congress who would gladly appropriate more. The SVO program is only, has only been appropriated $15 billion. Now, granted, there's a lot fewer businesses that are eligible, but but it is a much smaller appropriation. Um, what sort of follow-up documentation do you have to go through? Well, for those of you who went through the first round of PPP, you probably know that the uh, forgiveness process involves filing an application and providing backup documentation as to how you spent the money. SBA has not yet released detailed guidance on what's gonna be required under the SBO grants. We expect that like most government grant programs, and many of you know, I mean, government grant programs have been around for decades to foster everything from medical research to other kinds of R&D. Uh, but typically in a government grant program, there are periodic reports that have to be made showing how you're spending the money. Uh, there's no going out and buying luxury cars and yachts. It's uh, This is here to be spent on business expenses. Um, this, the SVO program is not open yet. The, um, the, this was brand new and you know, Rod can probably attest that this, this got dropped in SBA's lap uh, kind of last minute there in December. <laughs> is that a fair statement, Rod? It sure is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so as if they didn't have enough on their plate, now they've got this brand new program. And I don't, I think it's fair to say Nothing like this has ever been done before. Uh, probably fair to say nothing like PPP it might be had ever been done before. So here's another groundbreaking program that SBA is trying to get their arms around. But they, I, I think we can expect an application form and some guidance coming out from SBA pretty soon. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to hold Rod to a date. He, I think that's out of his control, but. Uh, but anyway, I think we can expect to see guidance pretty soon. So any 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 yeah. entities, any owners out there that think you may qualify for this, certainly I'm I'm available to answer questions. I think uh, we've certainly been telling our clients who fit in this category, uh, it's a good time to to get yourself organized. 
uh, once the window for applying here opens, uh, $15 billion could go pretty fast. Uh, I won't go into, there's some, there are some, oper there are some uh, provisions of the program that do set aside uh, the early applicants um, who have the most severe revenue declines will have like the first window of opportunity. And I wasn't going to go into all those details, but for anyone who fits this, uh, fits this mold and wants more information, certainly feel free to, to follow up with me. And with that, I think we're handing off, handing off again. To Craig, Sorry right? about that. I was on mute. We are ha handing off to Craig Engelhout. Craig? Well, well, thank you, Sherilyn. I appreciate it. And and I think there's a lot of information that everybody has put out there. And, and quite frankly, if I if I stood silent, I think uh, <laughs> I think they'd have enough to digest already. Uh, my role in the bank is is basically uh, I'm I'm with Mark Blackston, and we're both with M and T Bank. And 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 quite frankly, I help um, um, explain a lot of the SBA programs to our clients as well as. Um, to uh, the accountants and, and folks out there that have to deal with this stuff. If you have some questions, um, I'm sure your accountant could help. Uh, I'm sure your banker could help no matter where you bank, whether it's your branch manager or your business banker. Um, for the most part, most of our loans are coming through business banking clients at this point, especially the second round of PPP. Um, in regards to the new um, um, subsidies and, and the new rules for the SBA loans, um, they're absolutely to your advantage at this point, especially from any any authorizations that are done from February 1st on. Um, it's, it's definitely worth a conversation. Uh, reach out to your banker no matter where you bank. Um, and uh, just a, a plug for M&T, we're actually number one in the number of loans that we approve um, for the past couple of years, whether it's the Washington District Office, which includes um, Northern Virginia, um, as well as Washington, D.C., and, and Central Maryland, as well as the Baltimore metro area as well. So we do a lot of SBA loans. We have a, a good back office that, that facilitates this. We're strong supporters of the SBA, and you've got your partners here. And with that, um, I, I'm, I'm happy that if we have any questions, Cheryl, and I think this is probably a time to go into those. All right. Um, again, let me just remind you that you are welcome, all of our guests today, you are welcome to put some questions into chat and we will add those to the questions that we are going to, to start with right now. Okay, guys, this question, our first question is regarding NAICS codes. This is really probably for, for Rod. Does the NAICS code on the PPP loan application need to match what is on their most recent tax return? What should a borrower do if the NAICS code on the tax return is incorrect? Or in other words, not an existing NAICS code or uh, not appropriate? Well, I'm sure there's an, an existing NAICS code. So fix the NAICS code. That's what you need to do to match um, what your business actually does. It needs to reflect that. Okay. All right. We we continue, as you know, Rod, we continue to get questions about the conflicting NAICS codes. All right. Next question. I think this is really for anyone. If a business owner is doing the second PPP, the application says to enter only 2.5 times the monthly amount of payroll costs. Does that mean we're only eligible for 10 weeks on the second PPP? We are going to use 2019 payroll costs as we have been forgiven already for the first PPP and used 24 weeks as the covered period. Yeah, I could take this. I think this is maybe a question about two things. So there's two questions embedded. One is, what is eligible for the loan amount when they apply for the second draw. And that is that two and a half times average monthly payroll counts uh, in the one year period that you're using, whether it's 2019, 2020, or that 12 month period I, I mentioned uh, briefly. 
Uh, so that's question one. I think the, the second question, and Rod or John, feel free to jump in. I think that might be related to the, how, how, how you can use that once you get your loan. So under the current uh, legislation, um, they have up to the 24 weeks to use those funds um, yeah. at, up to the 24 week period. So, um, and that that's was right. further clarified in the first round, but it's basically up to the 24 week period that you have to use those funds once you're approved, funded for this PPP 2.0 second draw loan. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add anything to that? Okay, no. great. Uh, hey, um, hey, Cheryl, Cheryl Lynn, I was having some okay. microphone problems. I did want to add in uh, to the, back to the NAICS code question, um, just to for anybody who's wondering, you know, how do I change that NAICS code? Um, you you want to have it match what's on your last tax return, but it yes. really is as simple as if you assuming you have not filed your 2020 tax return, I don't think hardly anyone has, but it would simply be to file an amended 2019 tax return, but it's an easy amendment. You're simply changing yeah. the NAICS code that, that appears on the tax return. Thank you, John. That is yeah. a question that trips up people on that application is the NAICS codes. We, we get that often. All right. I know this is one of Rod's uh, favorite questions, but it is a question that people continue to ask. What happens if we're showing a loss of 23.9 or 24.7%? Is there any wiggle room on the 25% loss? No. The loss okay. Of the IFR says 25%. All right. Thank you. And, Does and a and hey, Rod, uh, one question that I know we've had some clients ask, but I think I know the answer. You confirm for me. I've had some people say, well, I'm at 24.8%. Do I get to round up? I believe the answer is no. It's no. like 25 or more. Correct, sir? That's correct. That's the threshold. No wiggle room. Correct, right. Rod? That's correct. All right. Yep, thanks. Does a PPP applicant need to have at least 51% ownership by a US citizen or just make sure they have less than 300 employees and qualify under size standards? If I understand it correctly, it's a US citizen, right? Yeah. You must be a US citizen and for right. PPP 2.0, 300 and under. Yeah. Anybody? That's, that's it. That's it. Does anybody else want to add anything else? Any other comments regarding foreign entities? I think you you can be owned by a foreign entity, but you um, in measuring whether you are under that 300 employee standard, you need to include the headcount of all the other affiliates owned by that. In other entity. countries. And uh, exactly worldwide. Correct. So, so you may have a, a local U.S. business that uh, that may only have 50 employees, right. but if but if the parent company sitting in Denmark or wherever, I mean, if they've got um, you know more than another 250 employees worldwide, then you're over 300. Now let me ask you this: um, Did the same rules apply for those uh, our guests today? Did the same rules apply for the first for PPP 1.0? They they did, they, did. Uh, they 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 there there were a couple of different. I mean the the, the guidance changed a couple times. Uh, it did. So, um, but but that is ultimately that is where the guidance landed. Is that now it was a 500 employee limit for round one, but the basic criteria around affiliation was the same. Okay, all right. Next question. Based on SBA guidance, banks deducted idle from first round of PPP, how do you get the idle credit back? Who will do it? SBA or the banks? When will this happen? I can maybe take that. Um, first, I'll say we, banks are still waiting for the procedure in which that those reconciliation is what the SBA is calling it, um, yeah. it to come back to the banks. So. Um, the law did change that. So there are situations where someone um, went through the forgiveness process for PPP1, they got forgiven. And then when it got to the SBA, they said, hey, I saw you had $10,000 idle advance. 
So what they did is they deducted that $10,000 under the old program rules um, and, the, and the borrower would be responsible for paying that back. So fast forward legislation got updated in December. Um, so the SBA has communicated that they will be reconciling those situations. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, our understanding is, and Rod, keep me honest, is the SBA will credit back those situations to the bank and then the bank applies that to their client. And it's the bank that they requested the forgiveness from that would be handling that. Now, the yes. actual procedures have been released yet, so we don't know when yet. <laughs> and all of that is very true. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to take, we have a couple more questions here, but I would like to take one from the chat. We have a 2020 tax return done. Can't complete it. Wow. Can we use that to prove 20? 25% down in the business comparing to 2019 tax returns. So yeah. let me say it again. We have a 2020 tax return completed. Mm -hmm. Can we use that to prove the 25% decrease in the business comparing it to the 2019 tax return? Yes, yes, you can. If, if uh, God, mm -hmm. God bless you. If you've got your taxes done already for 2020, mm -hmm. then then you were, and if you were down 25% year over year, then then you are good to go on that test. Because yes. the, the presumption has been, if you're down 25% for the year, then you have to have been down 25% in at least one quarter. So yep. yes, you're good to go. Anyone else want to add anything? Okay. No, that's All right. Short and succinct. Yeah. Okay. Next one. If there is an idle advance, that amount is included in the PPP calculation and the maximum amount for first draw or the first draw, it's kind of a question. As a lender, would our PPP amount be the amount minus the idle advance or the amount of the PPP and the advance amount? It should have been, well, all right. So it depends on the order. But let's take the order of you applied for the idle advance first. Then you got the PPP. So let's just say that the PPP was came in at 100,000. The idle advance was 10. So that 10 idle advance was to be deducted, right, from right. the 100,000. Oh. So, okay, so now your PPP loan is actually 90,000. Oh, I think he froze. Rod, we'll, we'll wait for Rod to unfreeze. Um, if anyone else wants to um, jump in, possibly, if you're able to try and give a little bit of uh, color around that answer. Or we'll go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. What if you don't have a bank statement for the three to six months? Can you still get the first draw PPP? I think the, I'll take that one. Uh, I think it depends on what sort of payroll documentation you have. Okay. Um, if, you, if you use an outside, let's say a third party payroll service like an ADP or paychecks, paylocity, uh, they will they will produce payroll reports for you, which I believe Mark will agree that that's acceptable evidence for payroll uh, for any lender. If you are, um, if if you do payroll in house, uh, whether it's through QuickBooks or just doing it out of your checkbook, then then you do need to have bank statements uh, showing that you you paid that amount. Um, if you don't have the bank statements handy, I, again, I think Mark will agree, practically every bank has the ability to retrieve old statements for you electronically or otherwise. Excellent. Uh, yeah, Ryan, I agree. Yeah, Mark, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was just agreeing with John. He, he said that very well. Okay. Rod, you're back um, yeah. from Zoom frozen tundra. <laughs> um, so let's go back to that idle advance um, for a minute, if you want to just repeat what you said before. Okay, so where I left off was, all right, so now you've deducted that 10,000 from the 100,000, so now you're left with 90, 
So when you go for forgiveness, the actual amount is going to be $90,000 that you're looking to get forgiven. And actually, it, it was handled the correct way by the bank when they deducted that, that $10,000. So when they send it to the SBA, and we get back to the, as long as the money was used appropriately, 60-40, then you should get the 100% forgiveness for that, or the 90000 as long as the ten thousand dollar idol was deducted from that one hundred thousand. Okay, um, John, I know you answered uh, a a question in the chat, but I'm going to read it for everybody because I think it's um, it's important. Can we use the fourth quarter, twenty twenty financial statements compared to the first quarter of twenty twenty financial statements, or do we have to use twenty nineteen? financial statements of any quarter to compare with FY 2020. And then John, I'll go ahead and read you. Uh, John's response was, you have to use matching quarters of 2019 and 2020. So if using uh, third, fourth quarter of 2020, then it must be compared to the fourth quarter of 2019. Anybody yeah. care to elaborate or anything on that? Well, and, and Cheryl, and I'll jump in because I know we've had this question come from some, we've seen this with some of our clients. Not everyone uses December 31 as their year end. Some businesses have an April, April or May right. or, or August year end. You, you, you do have to measure based on calendar quarters, not okay. on what are called your fiscal quarters. So it doesn't matter if you're a May year end. You're, if you're a May year end, your fourth quarter would be March, April, May. For PPP purposes, that's that doesn't work. It has to be a calendar quarter, has to be a matching calendar quarter, <laughs> and um, and and don't forget to provide the evidence. We've uh, we've seen yes. clients get get uh, not not rejected but delayed because they fill out the application, they put down their revenue numbers for two different quarters, but they don't upload any any financial statements to right. prove it. So. Um, so don't don't forget that you got to include some kind of financial statements. As Rod said, they don't have to be audited. They can be out of QuickBooks, but you do need to sign them. Yes. Sign the first page, and initial right. the other yes. pages. Um, and I, I think Mark would say they they, they kind of have to look legit. Let's let's, right. uh, let's not write financial statements on a paper towel and think that <laughs> might work. And I think that's a that's a general rule. Um, you know, the pandemic. For, for many business owners was the first time they may have had interactions with SBA, right? And I, and I think that um, a lot of the borrowers need to understand that you are taking government funds and as such, you need to provide the appropriate documents. They need to be legal. They need to be, um, they cannot be fraudulent. You can't make up numbers. You need to back up all the documents that you are providing to your bank and then therefore SBA when um, particularly in the forgiven pro in the during the forgiveness process. So I think that's something that everyone needs to understand is that um, you know you can't make up numbers here. You need to back everything up. If you're showing a loss, that loss needs to be documented somewhere, right? So yeah, that's well said, Cheryl Ann. You summarized that perfectly. Um, and I would just add to John's comment, um, there are some situations, we do get also a lot of questions about that 25% uh, reduction that was just asked. Um, on page four of your form 2483, which is the application for the second draw, there is a blurb that depending on your specific scenario, um, you may be able to apply the quarter over quarter a little differently. And it's basically around if you, your business went in op, was in operation during certain periods of time over 2019. So I won't go through all those in detail, but pay attention to page four of the instructions on the um, second draw application. There's a section in the middle that goes through all the scenarios of comparing quarter over quarter if you have some unique um, situations to your business. Um, so just, just wanted to throw that out there as well. Good, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next question. This is from Cindy. If a business brought in new employees last November, how many employees should they include in the application? 
Well, I think, and Rod, you keep me honest here, but I believe the, the, the measurement is, is just like we did in round one. It's based on your average number of employees in 2020. It's not just a point in time. So I think technically you would measure your total employee count at each pay period in 2020. I suppose for a lot of people that they might just uh, round that off and make it each month. But uh, Rod, am I, I think I'm, I'm right at that. Yes. It's just like we used in the first round. Yes. All right. Any more, I don't want to cut off conversation. Any more to add on that? And I, and I okay. think Mark touched on this earlier. Remember, your ev every employee counts as one for this purpose. Yes. Uh, now for yes. forgiveness and the FTE counts there, that's a different story. That's that's for another webinar. But <clears throat> but for this purpose, full time, part time, all counted as one. Yes. All and right. No ten, and no ten ninety nine contractors. Okay, guys, because I keep getting that. <laughs> You know, people want to throw the 1099 contractors in there because they say, well, I'm paying them. But no, for this exercise, they are not counted. Okay. They were never counted, were they? No, Brad? they were, but, but they weren't. <laughs> but you still have people that ask that question. Okay. So I just thought yeah. I'd clear it up here now. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Can a sole proprietor of two businesses get a PPP loan for both businesses for their payroll costs. The owner is the only employee. So do they have separate EI? I guess they have separate EIN numbers. We would hope so, right? What do you mean? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> some people, <laughs> we got to ask that technical question because maybe not, right? They could just so be, let's, they could so be let, using, their, they could be using yeah. their social security number on both with two right. different names. Yeah, so I let's answer it both ways. So you've got a sole proprietor for two businesses, two different EINs. What's the answer? Well, John, you were going to say something. I, I was going to say, if it also got to consider, are they all being reported on the same Schedule C? Okay. Um, and honestly, I may, I'm not sure I know, can whether, in, I guess individuals can file more than one Schedule C. That's a question I'd have to look at. Okay. See, I would think if they have two separate EINs, right? They are two different entities, okay? Correct. And, and we're still looking at line 31 on the Correct. Schedule C, and you got two separate EINs, you know, applying the formula, I guess they would be eligible for PPP. There's nothing in the IFR that, that prevents that. Okay. Anyone, anyone else want to add anything to that? Okay, I'll go to the next question. So this individual from our chat would like to know, could you tell us about the relationship between PPP and PUA, unemployment benefit for a sole proprietor? And that one I don't, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, perhaps the person wants to spell out uh, PUA or give us a little bit more details. We'll wait for them to put it in the chat. Let's go. Let's go to. Um, I'm thinking about this out loud. So let's just okay. say that this guy is, is on unemployment. I guess maybe the question is, can he get unemployment and PPP at the same time? Is that John or or? Mark, do you think that what he could be asking there? I think so, although. Um, I'm not sure that would make sense, though, because if you're getting unemployment, I mean, you need to. Right. If you're well, getting unemployment, he shouldn't be getting PPP. Correct. That's my whole double, point. You can't. You can't double. Dip. You can't get. You can't double dip. Okay. So I think that's what he was that's asking. Probably the answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Some loan requests include other eligible payroll costs. This causes some applications to get an error code because the loan amount exceeds 
30 million payroll costs per employee. Is this limit in the IFR? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it sounds like um, it sounds like this person uh, or, or these are questions that we that we already sort of compiled from all the customers and borrowers. So it sounds like this is a problem when they're submitting after they fill out their loan application, right? Mark, this might be for you. Could be. So they're getting an error code in the portal they're using to apply is what I'm yeah. hearing. So yeah. I guess my quick response is every bank does it a little differently. So if it could be a technology glitch in their software or something that needs to be maybe discussed with their relationship officer, or branch officer, or whatever bank they're at, that might be kind of a good best practice. Yeah. Um, if it's m and obviously you can reach out to us, um, anybody on the call, like Craig or myself or Stephanie, um, we're happy to hopefully navigate that potential error if it's on a, if it's an M&T thing. But uh, go back to the bank that you're applying with, that they may be able to help you more. Yeah, because apparently um, says the loan amount exceeds 30 million. So I don't know where we get 30 million. Maybe maybe it's a typo and they mean 3 million. Yeah, 30, 30 million sounds like way too big a number. Yes. Exactly. There's there's no PPP for 30 million. Okay, next question. For sole proprietors, interesting. I like this question. If business owners collect income through Zelle to a personal account, are they able to apply for PPP? Well, you're getting paid through Zelle. Now, if you were telling me you were getting paid through Zelle and then, because it would count and, and it was going into his business account, uh -huh. then it would count as business income or revenue because he got paid for services rendered. Correct. Okay. But because it went into his personal account, it, it doesn't count. Okay. So let me ask you uh, another question. So, um, what is if someone does Venmo or PayPal? Same sort of thing. They're going to need to set up the business Venmo or PayPal account that allows them to track their business expenses through these apps, correct? Because as you can imagine, there's a lot of sole proprietors that get paid through these apps, right? That's fine, as long right. as it's going into the business. That's that's my whole point. They need to have a Zelle or a Venmo or a PayPal business account that tracks those business expenses and doesn't go to the personal. That's right. Right? Okay. That's right. Okay. And or provide supplementary documentation that shows their payroll tax filings, their payroll mm -hmm. statements, the, the standard stuff we were talking about earlier that might alleviate that specific manner of transaction. So that, that I would say, make sure you're keeping an eye on what else you need to provide to prove um, how, your, how your payroll is operating. Okay. We have a follow-up question um, regarding the PPP and unemployment benefits. So the follow-up is, can you get PPP if you stop getting unemployment benefits for 11 weeks? I think it All right, so well, go ahead. Probably, dep probably depends on what kind of, uh, what kind of payroll or sole proprietor income can be demonstrated. So if the sole, remember the sole proprietorship has to show income on the bottom line of Schedule C in order to be eligible, in order to, to generate eligibility, borrowing eligibility under PPP. Anything else to add? I mean, that's right, that's right. Okay, good. Um, so, it's a little technical, the IFR, for second draw PPP, how to calculate states to use 2019 payroll and tax documents, 
should borrowers not provide 2020 figures for health contributions, retirement plans, and taxes? Well, for PPP2, borrowers can use either 2019 payroll or 2020, but you can't mix and match. In other words, if you're using 2019 payroll, then you have to use 2019 employer contributions for health and retirement. If you're using 2020, you have to use those. So for example, if a business had had a pretty decent sized payroll in 2019, but, no, but did not offer really any benefits to the employees, and then say in 2020, they started paying a portion of medical, dental, 401k, what have you, you can't take 2019 wages and add 2020's employer portion of benefits. So it's got to be in, it's got to all be in one year or the other, but you do get the choice to pick either year. And clearly everybody in this panel would say, well, pick the year that's got the higher payroll. Right. That's going to yes. get you the better, the better loan amount, the higher loan amount. Anything else to add? No, exactly correct. Okay. Another question from the chat. How can a nonprofit organization submit the business ownership information? Mark, how, how were you guys accepting the application? Was it the um, executive director that had to sign off? Correct, the authorized signer on behalf of the nonprofit. And part of what they need to provide is documentation in the form of minutes that show they are the authorized signer for the nonprofit. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, Sorry. other banks may do it a little differently, but that's how we're, that's kind of how we're doing that. Yeah. Okay. We are coming up to um, the last questions that I have pre asked. Um, and again, to our participants, if you want to put some questions in the chat, please do so. All right, um, here's our question. I understand that I was able to use the first round of PPP money for an added new employee. Is this allowed for the second round as well? If the individual was hired as of January 2nd, 2021. That's that's fine. I mean, the it the the use of of second draw money really has nothing to do with whether an employee was on your payroll either before you apply for the loan or after you apply for the loan. I mean, if you a you know, business owner who gets PPP money and decides that they need to they need or want to hire some additional employees, it's perfectly fine. And that money can be used for that. Okay. Anybody want, Rod, did you want to add something to that? No. Okay. All right. All right. That's it for our questions. I'm going to allow um, our participants to put in last couple ones in the chat. Do you guys have any um, closing comments that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Between your state and local governments, right? So your state and local governments have loan programs and grant programs, okay? To help you sustain your business. And you have PPP, you have EIDL that you can apply to to help sustain your business. Now you have the Debt Relief Act that for three months, if you have an existing SBA loan, you get some relief for three months of principal and interest. Then if you apply for a new 7A or 504 microloan, the SBA is making six months of principal and interest payments on your behalf. And so to me, when you cobble all those funds together, in my opinion, um, you should be able to grow and sustain your business through COVID-19. I would suspect you would be able to do that, but you need to apply. Okay, do not sit on the <laughs> sidelines. You need to apply for this money, okay, in order to sustain your business. Now, uh, Rod, I would just, uh, I would just uh, add that if it's a new loan, after approved or authorized after February 1st, 
that the loan needs to be fully dispersed in order to get the subsidies from the government. Um, and if it's a line of credit, as long as they make a draw on that line of credit, they'll pay the interest only as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Oh, we do have one more question before we get to final remarks from John and Mark. A business opened in December 2019, not entirely for the full quarter. How do you provide quarterly statement comparisons? talk to that um so it depends um so kind of what i said earlier if you go to that page four on the uh, application instruction it does show you various scenarios if you were opened at various stages in the year 2019 so um there are two things and i'll read it just so for, for the group so for entities not in business during the first second or third quarters of 2019 but in operation during the fourth quarter of 2019 Applicants must demonstrate that grocery, gross receipts in any quarter of 2020 were at least 25% um, lower than the fourth quarter of 2019. So that, that, that may apply in this situation if they were only open for a little bit in that last month. It, but it may also be a situation for entities not in business at all during 2019, but in operation since February 15th of 2020. Applicants must demonstrate that ghost grocery receipts in the second, third, or fourth quarter of 2020 were at least 25% lower than the first quarter of 2020. So that's all there in that document. That, but I would I would recommend that individual take a look at their specific situation, how those nuances apply to them. Anyone Did I say that right, John Rod? <laughs> uh, well, well put. I was going to have to look that up myself, Mark. <laughs> All right, um, John and Mark, do you want to give some some final comments before we close up here? I I don't have it. I don't have anything else to add. I think great great questions, Sherilyn. Thanks for you keeping tabs on all this. Fine. <laughs> Mark, did you want to add anything? Okay. No, I just want to say thank you to the group again real quick. And Sherilyn, amazing job facilitating this. It's it's really great to be part of this as well as with John and Rod and Craig, of course. And, um, you know, always happy to be here to help our you know businesses with questions like this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy, would you like to uh, give some parting words? Okay. Sure. OK, yeah. Uh, thank you all the amazing uh, speakers and Sherilyn, uh, you're just wonderful moderator. <laughs> we wish to work with you uh, a lot in the future. And Ron, John, Mark, and Craig, uh, we truly appreciate uh, your time and expertise. Uh, so many questions today. So uh, we will wrap up now and uh, hope everyone has a you know, great rest of the day. And please check out our website for lots of new events uh, coming up. And we have an event for month in February. Uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, in our future events. And uh, again, thanks uh, to all the uh, speakers today. Okay, all right, bye -bye. thank you. It was fun. Thank Happy you, everyone.